Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 13th, 2013, and my guest is Joel Mokir, the Robert H. Strotz Professor of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Economics and History at Northwestern University. He has written widely on growth and technology, which is our topic for today. And our conversation will be loosely based on a forthcoming article in the City Journal he's written, Is Growth Really Over? Joel, welcome to Econ Talk. Hello. Now, you open with a famous quote that I've heard many times attributed to Charles Holland Duell, a late 19th century American patent commissioner. He allegedly said, everything that could be invented has been invented. You point out that he never said that. That's an apocryphal, inaccurate statement. What he actually said was the opposite. Quote, in my opinion, all previous advances in the various lines of invention will appear today, will appear totally insignificant when compared with those which the present century will witness. I almost wish that I might live my life over again to see the wonders which are at the threshold. Now, why are we so eager to believe the incorrect version of that quote that everything has already been invented and there's nothing left? <laughs> I don't know. That's a very good question why we're so eager to believe it. I suppose – Everybody looks some, for some kind of straw man, right? So, you know, if you're going to say that, here, here, look, I mean, here's, here's some idiot who said, you know, uh, America would be never discovered five years before Columbus or, you know, the earth is flat and then we all have a good laugh at this, you know. But poor man, you know, he, he never said that. They, people have actually researched this in, 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 in some detail and uh, quite, quite clearly he was thinking quite the reverse. So I suppose we all look for straw men and sort of people to beat up on after we make our point. And, um, you know, even if he didn't say it, it, you know, it's it's essentially like Winston Churchill, you know, he probably didn't say half the things that are attributed to him, but it sort of sounds good. Yeah, Mark Twain has the same uh, has Mark the same, Twain has the same issue. Problem. Now, exactly. Now, Robert Gordon has written that stagnation is the new normal and that future growth rates are not going to equal past growth rates and that there are these headwinds that are going to keep us from reaching what we've – the levels of growth we have in the past. Do you agree? No. No, I, I don't agree and um, let me sort of uh, push this metaphor a little bit. So, so Robert Gordon, who of course is my friend and my colleague here at Northwestern with whom I respectfully disagree, he he – talks a great deal about these headwinds. Now, some of these headwinds, I think, are more serious than others. But what he's completely leaving out is at the same time that there are headwinds, there are tailwinds. And he isn't saying anything about the tailwinds. Now, I would like to add, perhaps, that if you worry about headwinds, okay, there isn't a century in which there have been more headwinds. Uh, globally than the 20th century. I mean, you think about it and, you know, compare it to the, 20, the 19th century, say, for instance. Now, this is a century in which we have two global major wars, okay? The worst depression of all times between 1929 and 1939. The rise of totalitarian regimes of both the left and the right. Uh, the Cold War with an incredible amount of waste of resources on nuclear arms, on and on and on. And so, you know, plenty of headwinds, and yet this has been the most successful century in terms of economic history that ever happened. Okay, so Duell was absolutely right. And the odds stacked against it were just enormous. And so what people like me have to do is actually come out and explain how despite all these sort of institutional and political disasters, uh, basically uh, the human race has been able to lift itself up to a standard of living that would have been unimaginable in 1900. That's, I think, the main issue. But, of course, it is possible that there is a headwind. There is a f some force working against growth that is actually going to be – this time could be different. No. Yeah, it could be, you know, I, but I don't think so. I think there's very good reason to believe quite the reverse. If we look at what's happening to technology 
uh, there are very good reasons to believe that it is going to do things that nobody imagined uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And there are things that are, that are happening now and the things we're not imagining at the moment that will take place 10, 15, 20 years from now and on and on. I think that is basically what's going to happen. Now, they won't be all be good. You know, technology always is a mixed bag, not for nothing that Schumpeter called it creative destruction. It's creative, but it also destroys a lot. There's always pain to go with the gain. And, you know, sometimes uh, the pain is pretty bad, but that's the nature of the beast, okay? That's just what, what innovation is about. But basically, my attitude is when you look at technology, you know, I'm not making any predictions about politics and, you know, what's going to happen to democracy and things like that, because that's not my field. When you're looking at technology, my attitude is you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, the best is still to come. And uh, there are enormous – you know, go on. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that view. I, I'm, I'm on your side in this, in this debate. I think one of the problems we have in getting people to believe it is they say, well, how do you know? And then you say, well, let's go to the past and say 20 years ago when it was uh, 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 the Internet was uh, was a, a tiny little phenomenon. It, it, it's a, it was a totally different world. And you could not, as you say, you could not have imagined not only the technology that was coming and the things we would do with it, but the jobs that would be created, the opportunities for human expression that, that didn't exist then. Absolutely, absolutely, and that that and you know, and I, I for I'm, I'm a historian, so for me the internet's all recent stuff. But I look back at the last say 400 years. I'm starting. I, I'm very happy to start in in um, in 1600, and um, you know, I, actually I don't belong to the school of people who thinks that well. You know, if you want to predict the future, just look at the past and you know uh, try to extrapolate. Uh, I, I don't actually do that. I think we're living in an age in which everything is so different that there's very limited things you can learn from the past. But here is one of those limited things. Okay, so uh, what the way the innovation occurs is it has a very complicated and subtle interplay with what we know. So you know, essentially, you could think about about technology as something that we do, right? Techniques are, are, are nothing more than a sort of recipes. You know, here is, you know, how you bake a cake. That's not different in principle, at least, from here is how you make an ingot of steel or how you build a nuclear reactor. I mean, the, the, the recipes are longer, more complicated, obviously. But essentially, this is what the techniques are about. They're a list of, of, of instructions. Whereas it behind the that, application of a, knowledge. Yeah. So behind that, of course, there is a set of knowledge of, 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 of uh, you know, natural laws and regularities that, uh, that we have understood. Okay, so you could call that science, but there's more to it than science because that also involves sort of very banal knowledge, like you know, in Chicago it's hot in the summer, and 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 cold in the winter, or something like that. I mean, so it's not doesn't have to be science, but it's something we know about our environment. Now here is. Uh, the way I see things, these two types of knowledge interact with one another in a very subtle way. It's not just that we discover laws of, of science, you know, we discover relativity or quantum mechanics, and then we go and build a nuclear reactor. It's much more complex than that. By building a nuclear reactor or by building, you know, television sets or, or, or smartphones or something, we learn more about science and back and forth. Okay, so these two reinforce one another in a very subtle way. So here is one way in which this reinforcement occurs, and that's, I think, critical. Science can proceed when it has better instrument and tools to study nature. Now, these instruments and tools are built by, you know, uh, people who, who make things, right? So there could be, say, opticians who make better microscopes or better telescopes, or there could be, um, you know, somebody else who makes a set of lab instruments. But basically, science can advance largely because it has better instrument at its disposal. So it is not by accident that we think of the 17th century 
there's an age in which a scientific uh, revolution occurred because that is when opticians for the first time built a set of lenses by which Galileo could look up in the sky and find uh, the moons of Jupiter, which had never been observed by a human being because our, our eye isn't equipped to do that. So the telescope and the microscope and the vacuum pump and a whole bunch of things like that basically helped trigger what we call the scientific revolution of the 17th century, culminating in, 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 in a grand crescendo with the work of Isaac Newton. That's all pushed in large part by better tools, better uh, instruments. Now, if you think about what we have done in that dimension today is we have added a tool that nobody would have dreamed about before, namely high-powered computing. And, you know, you look at what's happening in science today, in any kind of research, not just, you know, natural sciences, any kind of research. It's unimaginable to do it without computers. They gave a Nobel Prize to chemistry this year to a bunch of people uh, who basically started to uh, simulate mo large molecules with computer programs. But this is something that Lavoisier, the founder of modern chemistry, could not have imagined because he couldn't have thought about the kind of computer uh, power that these people have at their disposal. Right? He just, if he had to, to do a calculation, he had to do it by hand. And that's the way it was until fairly recently in historical point of view. Today, the computer power that we have is so immense that endless problems that we've been uh, uh, struggling with, all of a sudden I was in solution, all the way from the solution of, say, you know, very difficult mathematical equations that have no solution, uh, uh, but can be uh, simulated and calibrated by means of machines, all, you know, all the way down to studying, you know, 15th century authors and doing a word analysis by the means of computers. So this is the most powerful research tool that humans have ever invented. And we've just started to scratch the surface. We've just began this. Now, you think about the chemistry and the physics and the nanotechnology that these machines will develop, and you see what they will then do to further instruments, and you could sort of see this mutually reinforcing process that's basically going to launch us into an orbit that we today even cannot imagine. That's why I'm an optimist. You see, I think that's the way things actually work. So I want to bring up two challenges to that view uh, and, okay. and get your reaction. Uh, Edmund Phelps was a recent guest on the on the program, and he was uh, dismissive of science and inventions as important causes of human advancement, and he emphasizes much more small trial and error applications at, at a very micro level. Yes. You, you seem to disagree with that. I do, do disagree with. That. I know Ed and, and Ed, and I know his book, uh, Mass Flourishings. I've just I've read it and I've actually reviewed it. Um, and you know he's a great economist, but I think he's wrong about this. I think he doesn't quite understand that every once in a while, um, uh, what we need is a conceptual breakthrough, without which these mass little things that he's talking about, which are which I'm not at all denying. They are important. A lot of innovation is happening in very small increments by entrepreneurs. You know. But uh, basically, if there is no further expansion of our understanding of nature and of physics, of chemistry, of biology, um, then at some point, Ned's mass flourishings are going to run into diminishing returns. Every economist understands if you have a fixed factor and then you add a variable factor at some point, uh, this is going to run into diminishing returns. And so classical physics, you know, as it was, uh, you know, culminated in the world of a, a late 19th century uh, work of people like, like Kelvin, uh, basically could take you just so far, it could not do for you what quantum mechanics did. And so you need a big step around, and then you need a big step, and once quantum mechanics is around, then a whole bunch of things in electronics and other fields follow, okay? But, with, but, but I don't think that it's conceivable that things like quantum mechanics and relativity, and, you know, I can, the list goes on and on, could have developed through 
Ned's mass flourishing. So he's telling half the story, but he's forgetting about changes in the fixed factor. So he uses and examples. My, he uses examples like the railroad or the steam engine and suggests that yeah. they're overrated. He, well, no, I, I, I think his his view of technological history differs quite materially from mine. Um, the steam. Let me let me give you. Let me let me let's talk about the steam engine because I have you know know something about it and I've written about it. So here's the thing about the steam engine. Okay, and you're absolutely. He's absolutely right. The steam engine, the first working model of the steam engine, was installed uh, by all accounts in 1712 by a guy uh, called Thomas Newcomen, who was a sort of a blacksmith and an instrument maker uh, in England. Now, you think a little bit about the thing that he built. And what he built was an atmospheric engine, okay? So it was based on the principle, later much modified, that if you create a vacuum in a cylinder, okay, that the pressure of the atmosphere will allow you to push the piston up and down as the steam expands, okay? So now what do you have to know to build a machine like that? Well, clearly you don't have to know what we call today thermodynamics, which was, invent which was developed really a century and a half later, than the steam engine, and, and actually was more a result of the steam engine than the other way around. But you had to know one thing, Russ, and that, and you have to had to understand that the Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere. We actually living at the bottom of an ocean uh, of air. Now everybody in the world today knows that and understands that, but the truth is that this wasn't really fully realized until one of Galileo's students called Evangelista Torricelli was the first to fully realize that there, that there is atmospheric pressure that is pushing us down on this earth, okay? And uh, so once you have that, um, you know, the obvious thing is you build a barometer and then, you know, people were running up and down mountains and showing that the pressure was actually uh, going up or down as you, as you went up. It, it, the pressure went down and so on and so forth, and that the pressure of the atmosphere could be used so that this famous picture, and uh, many people who've taken a course in the history of science will have seen it, of these two uh, uh, separate copper globes that were put together by a German scientist called Otto von Guericke, who was also uh, Lord Mayor of, of, of city Magdeburg, and he put those two copper globes together and with the means of an air pump, he sucked out all the air, and then he spanned two horses to each side of the, of the globe and showed that they couldn't pull it apart, that the pressure of the atmosphere was so strong that horses couldn't pull, pull these two globes apart uh, simply because there was a vacuum inside. Now, that, that was a, a major breakthrough, and this is not a case of mass flourishing. This is a bunch of highly trained, highly educated, extremely imaginative people, uh, Torcelli, Guericke, uh, Blaise Pascal, the famous mathematician, was involved in this. There's a whole bunch of people. And by sort of 1660, this becomes widely known. And there's no doubt that Newcomen must have understand, understood that. Because without that, the whole idea of an atmospheric engine, whether it was the Newcomen variety of a diff, slightly different variety that was developed a little bit before by a guy called Savory, that you couldn't have imagined a steam engine without knowing that there is an atmosphere. And so people always ask, you know, could the Chinese have built a steam engine? And the basic answer is no, unless they had discovered what the Europeans discovered in the 17th century, which is uh, the existence of an atmosphere. Now, once you have that knowledge, okay, then a lot of tinkering and a lot of sort of little improvements will get you a long distance. But without that, uh, the idea of a steam engine is no more, in my view, no more plausible than uh, building a nuclear reactor without understanding, uh, you know, uh, atomic uh, theory. So in that sense, I think Ned is wrong. You know, you have to know something in order to... Uh, in order to build an advanced machine. And much of, then much of the knowledge comes subsequently. I, 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 I totally agree. But there are times when science makes a big step forward and says, all right, now we can do this and we cannot do that. Okay, here is another example. Now you get me going. So think about modern chemistry. So modern chemistry has been an incredible source of uh, progress, right? Without modern chemistry, we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have fertilizers. We wouldn't have you know uh, uh, 
synthetic materials. We, you, anybody understand, understands it. Now, chemistry, as we understand it today, was essentially the product of, I would say, at most a dozen people working between 1760 and 1800, okay? The largest of which was Antoine, the great Antoine Lavoisier, but there were other people involved, okay? But this is a major scientific breakthrough, after which, you know, lots of mass flourishing are possible. Without those people, without modern chemistry, uh, this would have been inconceivable because people had the totally wrong model of how materials work. And, um, and, and no, nothing, would have, nothing would have really worked out. Okay, you want another example? You know, why don't you get me going? Well, let, me, let, me, well, let, me cha- let me challenge you with a different issue because I agree with you. Um, let, me, right. let me ask you a different question. Uh, Tyler Cowen, also a previous guest on this program, mm-hmm. has said, well, the, the rate of growth is slowing down. And uh, what's coming in the future is actually we're going to maybe have some acceleration along the lines you've talked about because of smarter machines and tools. But for the average person, it's going to be kind of bleak because smart machines are going to take away the jobs and the skills that we have, which is our humanity, our creativity, our brains. And uh, the people at the upper end are going to be happy and rich, but the average person might have a lot of trouble in a world of smart machines. What do you – as an optimist, how do you answer that? Well, that, that, you know, he, this is a much more, I think, serious issue. I think it can be dealt with, okay? But that kind of danger always exists. Technology has the tendency to make skills obsolete. And the real problem is not that it will not create new jobs, new occupations, new specializations, new challenges. The problem is that the people who are losing their, well, they're not losing their skills, but their skills become sort of valueless. Um, these are people that typically will be very difficult to retrain in the new in the new occupations. And so, what you may well observe is a whole generation of people who will sort of go through what the hand loom weavers went through in the industrial revolution, which is their skills became obsolete. They were uh, too old, or for some other reason, uh, uh, incapable of being retrained and they died bitter and disappointed and many of many of them poor that is what technology does now in the very long run i think the economy will cope with that and it will cope with that in a variety of ways one of the, of course which will be will be that we are going to be creating new occupations that are a result of the new technology, okay? So you asked somebody in, in, sort of in 1945, oh, well, we forget, oh, suppose you told somebody, you know, that machine that, you, that von Neumann built, you know, that machine is going to be really small and it will have, the, you know, uh, uh, five million times the computing power. And here's what it's all, it will, it, it will can do. And he will, would have worried. Well, what kind of work will people do if machines will do all the thinking, all the computing? So here is an occupation that, a person in 1945 would not have imagined. I just pulled something out of a sleeve, but you could make many. Say, uh, um, a computer game developer. So people who write computer games. Now, the notion that you could play games on a computer would have been rather... Uh, bizarre. Uh, bizarre in somebody in 1945. I mean, they would think of computers as calculating, you know, ballistic trajectories, but, you know, playing Pac-Man or, you know fighting the Trojan War all over again, which I understand you can do to the computers. Uh, that kind. So there, are, there will be new occupations for people like that, or people who do cybersecurity or, 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 or things like that. Uh, here's another thing which I, I, I just uh, occurred to me the last few days because NPR were doing a, a series on this, but this is absolutely true. Uh, modern technology allows us you know, to actually engage in transactions that before that would have been extremely difficult because of a variety of informational asymmetries and transactions cost. Okay. So you look at somebody like something like Airbnb, okay, where people actually become sort of mini hotel owners to other individuals. So this is a peer to peer trade in which I contract with somebody in San Francisco to rent an apartment for a weekend. So that person now has a job. He has to clean the apartment. He has to, you know, wash my sheets, blah, 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 blah. And I pay him. So that person now has an occupation that he or she couldn't have had before 
because without the internet and without the sort of clever setup of that of that website uh, this could not have happened Here, here's well, they another could, example they could do it they could do it but it's a small number of people because as you point out it the transaction been, it, costs are too are very high the transactions cost would have been too high and what this what what these sites do which is really nice is you know you actually have a very strong incentive to be well behaved about this and not to engage in opportunistic behavior so that I am not going to go and rent somebody's apartment for a weekend and then trash it and, you know, and, and break the furniture or whatever, because if I do, then the Bad website review. will know and, and they, and they will, and they will, they will penalize me by not letting me ever use it again. So it's, it's very cleverly done. Here's another example of, of things that you can do, which I, which I just learned. Um, so people, <laughs> Who buy, like me, who are totally hopeless when it comes to putting together things? Okay? They go to Ikea or to a furniture store, and they buy a new desk, and it comes in a box with you know, a million metal parts and screws and, 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 and parts, and they haven't a clue about how to do this, and they spend two miserable days trying to put it together and then do it wrong. You can actually go on the Internet today, fire somebody who has nothing, you know, who, who, hire somebody, and get them to do this for you for a small fee. Now, those are markets that we wouldn't have been able to imagine uh, a while ago. So, you know, what I think is that as the technology evolves, it will create new opportunities for people to, uh, uh, to engage in activities and occupations that we cannot today uh, even imagine. Okay, so, so I'm sim- – I'm sympathetic to this view, and the, you know, the example I like to use is, is agriculture. In 1900, 40 percent of yeah. the American workforce was on the farm. If you told a farmer or an average person, anybody in 1900, that in 100 years it was going to be 3 percent, they'd assume we'd starve to death and there'd be mass revolution because nine, mm-hmm. that 40 percent, 37 percent of them would have nothing to do. But of course it didn't turn out that way, and as you point out, a bunch of jobs came along and opportunities – but I think Tyler exactly. would argue – I want to give Tyler Cowan his due. I think he would argue that, well, what happens when the computers create their own computer games and the human beings can't do it anymore because they can't compete with those really smart machines? Well, we are, we are still groping about what computers can and cannot do, and it is quite clear that, of course, they can do a lot more things than uh, we can do today. You know, when I will have a robot – do a root canal job on my in, on my tooth, I'll start really worrying about that. But I think that's a stage we will not reach in the foreseeable future. And of course, what will happen is as computers do more and more jobs that were uninteresting, routine anyway, more and more people will be able to get into uh, jobs in which where it will be very hard for computers to to step in. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back on that. Okay? I again yeah. I, I like your argument, but what about the following? Uh what if I'd said to you 15 years ago the same argument you said, well, the day when when a when a robot can take out my prostate because it's got cancer, that's the day I'm going to worry. But we do have essentially robots that do that. Now they're guided by human beings. The issue, I guess, is whether the skill set that it takes to run that robot, to run that laser, if it becomes a very easy thing to do as the machines get smarter and more effective, it's going to be harder to make a good living as a surgeon. It may be, it may be good, uh, harder to make a living or as a, a dentist. surgeon doing what surgeons – no, no, listen. It's true. It will be harder to make a living as a surgeon doing what surgeons do today. But the whole point is that if when – when robots are doing more and more routine things, I'm not, you know, uh, you know, appendectomies and, and and things like that, skilled surgeons will be able to push the envelope out even further to do things which robots cannot do yet. And then when robots get there, they will just keep 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 ahead of them. Now, in the process, I think more and more jobs, more and more occupations will disappear. And that's, I, there I totally agree. I, I, I agree with Tyler. Most of the things that will disappear will be routine. So let me, let me, let me take a step back. Okay? What mechanization has done over the last 250 years, as you pointed out in agriculture, for instance, it's basically eliminated much of the back-breaking, uh, difficult work that wore people out. And that's and been great. Them, <laughs> it's been yeah. a good thing. And now we've done, we're in the process of doing the same thing with the manufacturing, right? So a lot more back-breaking, boring, you know, routine jobs 
are being replaced uh, by robots. And it's not just in manufacturing and agriculture. You know, it's in services as well. So, uh, you know, you, there are very few people now who sell tokens uh, to the San Francisco BART or the Washington Metro, right? You buy it out of a robot. It's not really called a robot, but that's right. what it is. It's an ATM machine. What, it's a version yeah, of the ATM same machine. thing. So these people, they're replacing really boring uh, jobs, you know, selling tokens. And, you know, and, and the Metro strikes me as an ultimately sort of dead, deadening, dull job. Uh, and so we replace these by robots. Now, you know, what, what happened to the person who was selling these these tokens? That's a hard question, but clearly nobody young is going to say, I am going to have a career in a, doing something that is routine uh, and dull because that's being done by machines. I'm going to find something that's more fulfilling. And precisely because technology is pushing on, such new jobs will be opening up. Now, that said, I also think that what you see over the 20th century in the, in, in the long run, not so much in the short term, in the long run, is people are working less. Okay? That we have, as a society, industrialized countries are enjoying a hell of a lot more leisure than they did. They have longer weekends. They have, um, particularly in Europe, they have long four or five week vacations. You know, and even in the States, you know, you know, most people probably are down to something like 1950, I think it's a lot of numbers I saw, hours a year which is, you know, considerably less than people worked at the beginning of the 20th century, which was somewhere around 3,000. So we have cut the working year in the United States by a third, and in Europe probably more, probably by, by half. So people are working less. They are spending more time uh, um, living a life of leisure as retirees and living a life of, life of, of, of quasi-leisure as people are accumulating their human capital. So we will have more time for ourselves you know, to do things that are fun. And here is the kicker, Russ, okay? Uh, what technology has done, it has hugely increased the value of leisure because there is so much more to do with leisure today than there was even 50 years ago, let alone the 19th century. I mean, 19th century, you know, people went to the opera and to the theater, but that was top, typically an upper middle class urban kind of phenomenon, okay? For the vast bulk of, of people, you know, the, amount, the num number of things you could do at your leisure time were by and large sitting around in pubs and, and taverns and drinking with your buddies. Yeah. Now, maybe, you know, singing, nothing... maybe singing a little bit or, or maybe gazing, singing gazing, bit, but, but, gazing into the fire. But think what the 20th century technology has done, Russ. I mean, it has created basically out of nothing and an entire industry called spectator sport. And so today you flip through your channels and you see hockey and basketball and football and baseball. And, you know, for those who like it, they can watch bo uh, golf and bowling. And, you know, that, 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 where, where is that coming from? Well, people have more time. People have more time because leisure is, is, is much more widespread, both at, at, the, at, the, at the sort of very young and, 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 old, and, and old ages, but also for people who are still, um, are still part of the labor force. And so in that regard, the notion that this is the sort of old uh, Puritan notion that those people who are not working aren't doing anything valuable with their time – I think that's something that we have to be very careful about. And I would like to quote here, you know, the great uh, 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 economist John Maynard Keynes, who, of course, wrote a little pamphlet, which many economists know, called, you know, Economic Lessons for Our Grandchildren, in which he predicts, and this is, he's writing this in, in, in 1929, if I recall correctly, uh, he basically predicts that, Actually, you know. I, I think it was, it might have even been 32. He, he was writing at a very well, I mean, dark it was, maybe time. It, it was a dark time. It, was, it may have been in, in maybe it was in, in the early 30s, but around that time, in any case. And uh, somehow the, the date escapes me, but it's easy checkable. But, 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 but what he points out is that future technology will act, might actually create a really short work week and for a lot of people essentially leave, ma make work completely redundant. Now, that does, of course, requires a complete reorganization of um, – of society because these people have to get income from somewhere and you could think of societies that for, for, for in one way or another uh, have had to solve that problem already because of some some windfall so you think about a place like Kuwait say or, or Norway and these countries are extraordinarily rich and for all practical 
political purpose in those countries, uh, work has become, you know, an option rather than a necessity. And, um, you know, we may well move if, if we have, if we are able to robotize uh, things enough and automate things enough, th- there will be a hell of a lot more leisure uh, to consume and there will be far more things to do with leisure, including, of course, listening to programs such as yours. Yes, thank goodness. I, I wonder I wonder how many people right now are listening to Econ Talk while they're, quote, working. Uh, if yeah. you are, send me an email at mail at econtalk.org, whether you're taking – uh, leisure on the job. I- I'd love to know. Now, your point, your point raises uh, is related to a different point you make, which I, which I want to come to. But before I do that, I just want to say one thing about the Keynes essay. It's it's economic possibilities for a grandchild. I just googled it. it. Thank now, you. It was printed. It was published in 1930. Uh, it, it may have been written before, though, so I, you're, you could still be right. I was close. But I, I want to. I, I'll. Pro- We'll try to put a, a link up to it if we can find one that isn't co- um, copy protected. But I want to I want to mention the interesting side note about that essay is it has a a strong anti-Semitic streak in it where he blames the Jews for giving the world the idea of saving and compound interest and delayed gratification. And I'll put up something related to that as well. So that essay is, is very, it's very prescient. It has some strange, uh, not so attractive ideas about the virtue of saving. So. Keynes in that essay really decries savings as a bad thing, which he also was well, generally against for other reasons in, in 1930 probably. But let's – this was before 1936 when he wrote the general theory, but I'm sure he was he was already thinking about it. Now He's already thinking about it, and you're absolutely right. He, he blamed savings for the great – for the Great Depression, and so you can sort of see his thinking moving in that direction. And by the way, anti-Semitism was extremely common, of course, in in, in those days, particularly if he was writing it in, in the late 20s, early 30s. So, I, I, I mean, I don't approve of it, but, um, uh, but it, you know, it's not as uncommon as, as, as you would think. No, it I just bring it up. Different- I, br- I bring it up as an historical uh, footnote for people reading that essay. But the, the issue I want to – that you raise is – this issue about leisure and, and the unimagined amount of leisure we have and what we're able to do with it because of technology and the, the internet and television, et cetera, spectator sports, which is a sign of our tremendous wealth and our standard of living. You raise an interesting point elsewhere about measurement issues. So one of the issues you hear, and Tyler Cowen talks about this in a different book about the great stagnation, is that – and Phelps also and others talk about how – well, things are slowing down. We, we've picked all the low-hanging fruit. The stuff that's left now isn't as good. And your claim, which I'm, I agree with, is that, well, part of this is a measurement problem. And you write the following. You say, many of the most – this is a quote – many of the most important inventions of the late 19th and 20th century are things we would not and could not do without, yet they made little impact on the national accounts because they were so inexpensive. Aspirins, light bulbs, water chlorination, bicycles, lithium batteries, wheeled suitcases, contact lenses, digital music. Moreover, outdated conventions of national income accounting do not count leisure as a valuable good. People who are not working are not producing, and this is, quote, bad by Gordon's counting because they're not adding to output. But it may well be that a quiet life is not only the best monopoly profit, as Nobel Prize winner John Hicks famously noted in 1935 – but for many, it is the very end of a life of hard work. So talk about this measurement issue that what we're calling measured growth or measured standard of living maybe grossly understates its real value. Absolutely. So this is this is in you know, basically in some sense, this is one of the uh, dirty secrets of the economics profession, which is we all seem to be worrying a great deal about growth and about uh, uh, you know things that are, you know, depend on 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 on, on national income or, or or gross national product for their measurement. So you look at things not just not just not just uh, GDP per capita or something like that, which is sort of a standard measure of of. But you look at uh, things like like total factor productivity, which is essentially the same divided by some measure of input, and this is what everybody uses. But everybody actually knows that these numbers are. Uh, extremely misleading, and they get more misleading the more we u- use them for long-range comparison. So comparing this year's, say, GDP per capita with last year's and saying, well, the economy grew at uh, 2.8%, uh, you know, that, that, that in some sense is a 
reasonable statement because we don't think that in a year there's a great deal of the underlying structure of the economy that is changing. But we always have to keep in mind that these um, uh, measures were designed for sort of what I call a wheat and steel economy. So with an economy that produces a, you know, a bunch of goods that are more or less of constant quality, basically the same sort of basket of goods are being produced. And if we can next year produce more of it, because we have better machines or better technology or we work harder or more people join the labor force, that then we have, more, we have more output and so we have more income and we're richer and everything is good. Uh, uh, the problem, of course, occurs when you start looking at these things over longer periods of time and you start realizing that it becomes very, very difficult to compare to t- years in which a whole bunch of new goods and services have become available that a previous generation not only didn't have access to, but really couldn't even dream about. So we have in economics a concept which which we call um, consumer surplus, which is basically a measure of how much better off you are as a result of a a new good or a new service. And um, so there are different ways of measuring it, but uh, the sort of standard way is sort of trying to imagine going to a consumer and say, well, how much would you demand to be paid if we took that good away from you and put you back in, you know, 20 years ago when that good didn't, didn't, didn't exist? So, you know, we can play this game with, with, with cell phones and we can play this game with GPS and we can play this game with – and so you go to somebody and say, well, how much would you, would you have to um, – would I have to pay you if I took away the GPS out of your car? And hey, you can scratch your head and say, well, I'd go, go back and buy maps and, uh, you know, and, and, and study them while I'm driving. So, you know, there's a, there's a loss of, of welfare, but it's, it's not probably not huge. So my example of a very small invention uh, for which we could ask this question is um, anesthesia. So you go to somebody who's yeah. about to have surgery and you ask him, how much would you – Demand to be paid if I took out your appendectomy without anesthetizing you, without putting you to sleep. You know, just, it would be an infinite. Nobody would agree. The sum would be infinite. And, you know, now anesthesia, what, what has anesthesia contributed to GDP in, when it was introduced in the, in, in the 1850s and 1860s? Not very much. Nothing. Yeah, you know, not very it's, much. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's, but that is exactly the kind of thing that I think we fail to account for in our calculations. So, you know, that, that's why I gave that whole list of things. And, you know, we, I, at least we could make this list infinitely, infinitely large. It is these small things that actually don't amount to an awful large part of our income and product um, that, um, that actually have improved life a great deal and that we really wouldn't want to do without anymore. And the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is, despite the best efforts of economists, um, it's very difficult to account for that because not only that new goods are uh, showing up that never existed before, but also the old goods are getting you know, uh, considerably better. And, you know, there are techniques of dealing with that called hedonic techniques. They're but not very in, good. In goods that have, they're not very good because goods have many attributes. So you, ask, you look at your laptop and you ask yourself, in which ways is this laptop better than the 386 that I had in the 80s. You know, I could give you a list of 50 ways. It's not just speed or calculation. You know, the screen is sharper and the, I mean, and on and on and on and on and on, right? So you can't, the list is, is, is huge. The same is true, say, about, you know, automobiles, about communications, about on and on and on. So it's very hard to do this. And so in an age at which new products and new services come online all the time, and in which the old things are getting better in quantum leaps, okay, are now National in- income accounting system complete, completely fails us. Now, I should add that it doesn't just uh, undercount things because it doesn't count improvement. It also overcounts. Okay, in some ways, <clears throat> of course, national income accounting uh, uh, overcounts how much we're producing because it doesn't do, take into account uh, various inputs, various costs that are incurred incurred to society even if nobody foregone. actually pays it so yeah foregone yeah, leisure so you, yeah. 
Well, foregone lesion, but you can also think about about any kind of, say, environmental damage that if, that 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 production causes, including, for that matter, global warming, which may be may be, may be the mother of all environmental disasters. Um, and you know what what's happened is, you know, for 200 years, people have been burning coal and natural gas and oil, and you know, emitting carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere as if it was free. And it turns out it isn't free. Okay. Now, had we done the calculations correctly, we should have actually charged them for uh, uh, contributing to the damage to the planet and deducted those costs from their net value added. But we haven't done that because, of course, the atmosphere isn't owned by anybody. And so we, so in, now in the short run, in you know, comparing year to year, that may, doesn't make the, any difference. If you compare GDP today with GDP 100, 150 years ago, then it becomes meaningless. Yeah, I, I, it may be too high, it may be too I want to emphasize that, but I also want to make the point that I, I do think that uh, pumping sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, which we, I think, do less of, I think in many ways the environment's gotten clean over the last, say, 25 or 30 years uh, when people make these growth comparisons. And so you're right. Pollution is a negative. Uh, I think global warming remains to be seen. It may have a catastrophic impact. It certainly is not – all that carbon dioxide you've talked about – other than building it up, hasn't so far had an enormous impact on hu in human well-being or longevity. Whether it will in the future is what we're we're worried about. So it's yeah, an interesting yeah. it's an interesting challenge to even conceptualize sure. how you should measure it. But but the point you're making about about the challenges of measuring you talk about anesthesia. The example I like is the the worriers, the the negative folk like like Tyler and others who argue that well airplanes haven't gotten any faster. So it still takes, you know, we figured out the airplane, that's glorious, but then we haven't figured out the portable jet pack and that doesn't seem to be happening. And so therefore we're kind of stagnating. What I'd respond to that, one of the things I'd respond is that while I'm sitting in the airport, instead of having to hire a string, a set of, of musicians to follow me around to provide portable music when I'm on my trip, <laughs> right, which is only a luxury that a king could have had in, in the 19th yeah. century in his carriage, I have a thing in my pocket, in my pocket, that plays 10,000 songs at a quality that was uh, that's unimaginable. So th th there's enormous improvements, with, as you say, when we look across all the different the different margins. Yeah. But I will I will take this a step further. Right? I totally agree with you. But it's, it, and it isn't just the music. You know, it's communication. You know, you can actually do your work. I mean, I take a laptop with me. I spend three hours on a plane. Uh, 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 to give a lecture somewhere, and I'm actually fixing my 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 PowerPoint while I'm sitting on the plane yeah, because everything I need, or everything I've written over the last thirty years, is in that hard disk. And so if I say, "Gee, where did I say this and then that?" I go do a search, and bang, there it is. You know, at thirty thousand feet in the air. But here's something even deeper than that. I think complaining as. Tyler does, and other people do, saying, well, you know, we have, after 40 years of, 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 of technological change, it just takes as long as, is, as, it, as it did in, 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 in the 60s to fly from New York to London. And that's basically like complaining in 1890, that was all the technological change in, in the 19th century, horses don't run any faster. You know, that's... Horses don't run any faster, and there's probably not many ways in which we can make them run sufficiently faster to make much of a difference. But the point is the horses basically at some point are being removed from being the fundamental means of transportation and replaced by something entirely different. I would think that one of the things that is – and that I think this is a major, major change – one of the things that is coming – it's not coming as soon as I thought it was going to come, but it is coming, uh, is the death of distance. That is to say – a fabulous point. Uh, that, that is – we are basically no longer having to use airplanes in order to communicate for most of human needs. I'm saying most. I'm not saying all. I fully well understand that at times it's very important to have that personal contact, to share that beer – uh, to uh, you know, have that meal together. To you know, to, to, to but by and large, I think uh, what we are going to see is that communications and human interaction are going to be digitalized to a degree that we can't even imagine yet. Except when you're looking at two kids in high school sitting next to one another, and instead of talking, they're texting. Yeah.
And you go, what is going on here? Why don't they talk? Why this? They're, they're comfortable generation. with this. <laughs> they're comfortable. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't text because you know I'm 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 my sixties and I, too old. I'm no longer really good at getting onto that technology. But I can you know I can see kids who are twelve, thirteen year olds now when they are going to be at my age. You know this will be perfectly natural to them. And so for them, there is once you text to somebody with, with with somebody sitting next to you. Okay, there is no reason that for that person to be next to you. He could well be in Idaho and you could be in Maryland. And, you know, you're just texting, you're just communicating as if you were sitting next to one another. The same would be true for conferences, for meetings, for family reunions, for a lot of reasons that people are flying. Now, it is true that at the moment, airport, airline traffic is still going up. But I want to remind people of... Um, 2001 and 9-11, where, where airline traffic was basically ground to a halt for a, a couple of months, and how clever we were at that time with the technology that's now vastly improved in actually, you know, uh, substituting for travel and having meetings and conferences uh, uh, electronically. And I think that is going to be the way of the future. And, uh, you know, if something, God forbid, were to happen, to transportations, whether you know it's a, it's terrorism or or something else, I think this technology would take off like a rocket. Now, here's one more point about this: if that kind of thing is going to happen, it isn't just airline traffic that will be affected; it will be you know uh, uh, regular traffic. And so, if you are stuck in a in a uh, traffic jam uh, at rush hour in L.A. or in Chicago or in Washington D.C. or somewhere else, you know. 20, 30 years from now, the vast bulk of people who have to drive to their little cubicle or their little office uh, 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 today may well be able to do things from their living room at home. It's a, it's a fabulous point. It's a fabulous point, and it's, it's really an incredibly deep, deep point about the human enterprise. You think about – again, thinking, I think about what my life is like, and here I am teaching economics to – Thousands of people around the world, which is an incredibly gratifying and, and wonderful thing that I get to do with this program. And in the old days, if you wanted to hear an economist, you had to go go to him. You had to get you had to go. If you wanted to hear Adam Smith in in, in 1760, uh, you had to go to Scotland. Uh, and that's yeah. the way the world worked. And it's still true, as you point out. It's still nice sometimes to be face to face for a thousand different reasons and a thousand different things. But I'm taping this program right now in my own house. I didn't have to get in my car today. It's wonderful. And uh, my life's richer for it. I don't need my car to go faster to the, to the office to, to get to my, my taping equipment. I'm doing it from home. And think of, think of the liberating effects that this has. I mean, it isn't just that we'd be saving innumerable uh, human hours in which people are uh, which are wasted in commuting. By the way, the cost of commuting is not figured in in national income accounts, as you know. I mean, if you spend if you spend an hour and a half driving to to work each day, you know, bumper to bumper traffic, uh, that counts as leisure. <laughs> so you know, uh, so so. But, but obviously, if 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 I, if I can spare you that, uh, there'd be a major improvement in your economic welfare without making one iota of difference to national income. I've accounts. noticed, but that's an aside. I've, I've noticed that's an aside. <laughs> And I, by but the way, the main, I, I have to interrupt. I have to say that I just I didn't want to presume when I used that example of Adam Smith that I was anything like Adam Smith and as and as esteemed and um, insightful as my guest is. I'm not comparing you to him either. But none of uh, us. just an old. I just been an old economist. <laughs> no, 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 none, none, none of none of us can compare to the master. But here, but here is one more thing about think about this. Okay, and that actually I think is terribly important. The death of distance will not just save in commuting costs and, of course, pollution and gasoline use and, you know, wear and tear on tires and whatnot, okay? It's also incredibly liberating because what's happening is that for tens of thousands of years, until the Industrial Revolution, women were working at their homes while raising kids. 
And so they were, they were multitasking, we would call it today. Of course, they, they didn't use that term. But that's basically what they're doing. So they were producing textiles and they were milking cows and they were feeding the chicken while at the same time taking care of kids. What the Industrial Revolution did by creating the factory system and then later on, if, you know, the, the offspring of the factory system, like the office system, which is basically a factory system in which people sit at desks, but, but it's essentially the same, uh, is they separated the worker from her household and put them in a different, in a different environment. And so that's what, that's what essentially the Industrial Revolution did. That didn't exist before 1750 or practically not. Everybody worked at home. By 1914, in most industrialized people, whoever worked, in industrialized nations, whoever worked, worked away from home. Now, with the electronic digital revolution, okay, we can return people to work at their homes if they so choose. And I'm saying this as a brand new grandfather, okay, whose daughter has a job and who is now scratching her head on how she's going to go back to work, uh, who's going to take care of the baby. And part of the answer will be is you will because you can actually turn on your computer at home and, and when the kid is asleep or when the kid is playing with, its, with, with, with his toys, you can sit down and do your work. If you had to be in the office, if you had to be in the factory, if you had to be in the store, you would not be able to do that and you would have to find a nanny or you'd have to find a babysitter or you have to find a grandmother or worse, you would have decided not to have the child because knowing this in advance. And I think that that kind of thing is what the death of distance will really do. It will return people to their families. It will return people to their homes because they no longer have to go to offices and factories. Now, they still have the option. So if you really like to get out of the house and you need the water cooler effect or you need to, you know, to sit there with your buddies, you know, in the office and talk about sports or talk about work, that option still exists. Yeah. But this sort of nine to five commitment, five days a week, that will slowly erode for more and more and more people. And I think that is actually a huge development because that is the way humanity lived before the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful um, and I think true uh, insight. Now, why is it important that technology keep advancing? A lot of people would say we have enough stuff. We don't really need all these improvements. Our standard of living in the developed world is plenty high enough. We have these worries perhaps about the environment, other things. So let's just let's stick with what we have and um, we'll be fine. So here's my take on this, okay? And you know, I don't want to come across as somebody who is sort of a technology uber alles kind of guy, you know? I don't think technology is an undivided good. I think it always has, you, know, the, you get the bad with the good and for every positive outcome that and every opportunity that technology create there are costs and there are what 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 Edward Tenner has called bite back okay so you what you what what happens is you come up with a new a new invention or you improve some form of technology and um, you realize it improves life in some dimension but somewhat unexpectedly there's some side effects some unexpected bite back that happens and so uh, you have to find a solution to that and then technology often solves these issues and then you have to uh, look at the solution and it turns out it created bite back and so you have to find a solution to that and so it ever it goes on forever let me let me give you an example which i like and which really drives the point home okay so the human being has a built-in craving for sweets. Okay, we like sugar. We like honey. We like them. That's I think that's hardwired in us. I mean, I don't know, absolutely sure, but I I, I believe that's the case. Now, sugar was a major major uh, problem to acquire, you know, until you know a couple of centuries ago when finally. Europeans were able to grow sugar at a terrible cost to other people, but that's a different story in the Caribbean. And then in the 19th century, they actually discovered they could grow sugar themselves and uh, from sugar beets. So by, say, 1900, say, sugar is cheap, cheaper than it had ever been uh, in history. And people had access to as much candy and as much chocolate at very, at very low prices. One small problem, sugar destroyed their teeth. And so from 1900 till about 1950, the quality of teeth of people 
was declining dramatically because the sugar was wiping out their teeth. And so this was an unexpected bite back. Nobody had suspected that sugar was going to do this. And so here we have technology, if you, sugar technology, if you want, uh, uh, making an improvement, making us feel good because we can eat candies and chocolates, but what, but destroying our teeth. And so a new solution had to come up with, uh, to avoid uh, tooth, de- tooth decay. Guess what? Somebody discovered that if you put fluoride in the, in the, in the drinking water, you can counteract that. So that is a solution to a problem created by technological progress. You see what I'm saying? That's the kind of thing we have to do in order. And and so the same is true on a somewhat larger scale with food. So we, for, for for, for most of history, the problem of people was they weren't getting enough to eat and particularly they weren't getting enough uh, 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 fats and proteins. So we solved that problem because we're clever and our agriculture is more productive and we can, you know, we can produce every American can eat roughly almost every American. I don't say every because it's always, you know, a corner, but the average American surely can eat as much as fat and sugar and salt as they want. One small problem, there's bite back. We are, as a nation, we're getting obese. Obese has major health effects. We all understand them, you know, diabetes, heart attacks, blah, 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 blah. So now we have a bunch of scientists who are trying to figure out what exactly it is that makes some people more obese than others. And so once you discover that, hopefully we will find ways to prevent obesity, even from people who are uh, uh, essentially inclined to become uh, obese. And even and if we don't, don't very good self control. And even if we don't, we'll find technologies, and we are finding them already that reduce the effects of being obese. We we find well, things that lower blood pressure. My, my, well, we lower we lower blood pressure. We have better preventive st- uh, stuff for diabetes and heart attacks. The human enterprise think, just keeps expanding. Absolutely, but those are those are those are one kind of solutions to this kind of bite back. The other would be if we could actually figure out what it is that makes us obese. So there's been a huge amount of progress in the last 10 years uh, about the microbiota in the human gut. And it turns out that one of the main determinants of our health, not just whether we get fat or not, but also how our immune system works, is our interaction with these millions and billions, I should say, billions and billions of bacteria who live in our body in a symbiotic arrangement. So they don't make us sick, they keep our systems going. We've always sort of known this in the back of my head, in our, our heads, but now uh, a lot of research is showing how truly important the composition of the microbiota in our guts are. And there is research that's brewing right now in which scientists are coming up with ways in which changing the biota in our guts is actually going to be capable of preventing obesity. So that will be a further advance to solve a problem that's created by by earlier technological change. Now, you can extend this to essentially any field in which we're making progress, okay? In in some sense, what we talked about earlier, Ross, about global warming, that too is a form of bite back. Now, will we find a technological solution? Well, there are a bunch of things that are currently being researched, including geoengineering, including um, uh, carbon absorption. You know, we're working on it, but these are responses to bite back. Okay, and that I think is why technology cannot afford to slow down because basically much like the Red Queen and ours, okay, we have to run to stay in place because past technology has has created messes. It has created untidy things in the world, whether people are too fat or there's too much carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere or because we've invented antibiotics around which... uh, around which bacteria can mutate, okay? There's always something that you didn't think of when you came up with the, with the invention, and so you have to invent further to fix it. Well, the other that's part... The nature of, yeah, that's the nature of technological change. Yeah, the other part is I just think it's, it's part of our nature to, to strive and to discover and to say, oh, stop doing that. It's, uh, we've got enough. Is just not what we're about as a species. So oh, we're, out, we're, out of t- we're out of time. Why don't, why don't you... S- why don't you summarize your message? Summarize your message to those who view the future with fear and suspicion. Given that you're an optimist, 
Uh, give give me a closing give me a closing summary of your worldview. Yeah. So so my, my sense is that if we just are able to keep our political and social institutions from interfering, which is always a big if, and that's a separate as a separate conversation we will have. I think the amount of technological creativity that the human race is capable of. It will, I think, in the next 100 years, do things which we today find as unimaginable as somebody writing in 1912, like Charles Duell, would have, would have found, say, our smartphones and our GPS systems. Um, I, you know, this is the, the realm of science fiction, but I think even the most wild-eyed science fiction writer probably uh, won't be able to come up with the kind of things that the human race is capable of in its infinite ingenuity and creativity. My guest today, it's beautiful. My guest today has been Joel Mokir. Joel, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, it's been a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.